for this. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's very difficult to follow what we have just listened to, because I think when we're talking about sustainability, but also ESGs, uh, for sure, <laughs> ethics and behavior in companies is very important, and I think this is what we want to also learn from our distinguished panelists. And um, we have decided uh, to look not at barriers, but enablers. We want to be positive here, and we have three great examples. And I think we're going to look at the enablers in the field of technology. We have the professor. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to look at enablers through uh, customers, so listening to our customers and how we enable the customer <laughs> to enable sustainability. And then last but not least, uh, uh, what the banking system, the financial system can do for sustainability, and in particular, the value behind it. So with no further ado, I will start with the question on technology. So we think about sustainability, Internet of Things. We have heard about data in space, cloud, and how that can help in this field. What are the enablers here? How we can use technology to advance in the journey to sustainability? Let me give you my favorite answer to that question. And I wish I had come up with this, but somebody else did. This is a true story. There was um, somebody who was going around, you know what a yard sale is, a garage sale, when you sell the contents of your house? Um, there was a guy who was walking around a garage sale in a town in New York, and he saw a stack of newspapers from the 1990s. And for some reason, he was interested. So he bought them and he took them home. And he was looking through these newspapers from the 1990s. And he came across an ad from Radio Shack. How many of us remember Radio Shack? OK, great. <laughs> Electronics retailer. And he said, I noticed something interesting about this ad. There were 15 separate devices for sale in this ad from the 1990s. He said, 13 of them have vanished into my smartphone. So for example, um, how many of us still own an answering machine, tape recorder, separate film camera, camcorder, uh, Walkman, DVD player, right? Most of these devices, they don't, we don't buy them anymore. They have vanished into this very small, very materials light device. And if you take this and put it on one side of a balance scale, and take all those devices and put them on the other side of the balance scale, it's not even close. And that's my favorite example of this phenomenon called dematerialization, which is this wonderful optimistic phenomenon. I, I, get, I feel like I, I owe you all some optimism at this point. <laughs> so the optimistic phenomenon is that we are learning how to satisfy all of our wants and needs. We're not turning our back on growth and prosperity, but we're learning to do it while treading more lightly on the planet that we all live on. And there's a bunch of reasons why, but one of the most fundamental was that we have learned how to satisfy our desires to consume and communicate and compute and all that in a very, very, literally, a lightweight way. And so this is an obvious example, but there are examples happening all over the, all over the place, all over the economy, all the time, and they are actually letting us tread more lightly on the planet, which is some of the best news that I've, I've heard in a long, long time. I have a question, like a follow-up question. So I mentioned before the Internet of Things, and, uh, and, and let's look at circular economy. Mm -hmm. Can you just give us an example of that or, or of how this approach to circular economy enabled by technology can help sustainability? Um, what, what we're able to do is no matter what area of, of the economy, no matter what industry we're interested in, we're learning how to get more from less. That's the title of the book that I wrote about it. You mentioned the Internet of Things. If we put a sensor on everything and listen to what they're telling us, that allows us to stop heating and cooling buildings when there are not people in them or when we don't need them. It allows us to make more efficient use of our energy plants depending on the weather forecast and depending on the needs. So the way that we used to solve these problems was with brute force and a whole lot of energy. And energy is expensive, so we want to save on it. What we're able to do now with the digital economy and the Internet of Things is be much smarter, much more proactive, and a lot less expensive about exactly the same thing. So we don't need to sit around and shiver because it's too cold in the building. We just need to be smarter about heating and cooling all of our infrastructure. And we're learning to do that very, very quickly. 
Peter Hayes with more is, right? Do more with less. More from less, <laughs> so, exactly. At Lufthansa, I know it has not been a very easy year for <laughs> airlines, but we, we are starting again. And I know it gave you the time to reflect, right? And understand how to propel forward in a new way. So how did uh, the journey towards sustainability started at Lufthansa and how the customer-centric view enabled this journey? Well, I think it all gave us time to reflect, to reflect on what is it good to meet people for, when is it good that we see them digitally, and I think that this reflection of how do I travel, what do I need mobility, and when do I use tech, I think this is something that's quite valuable to make a sustainable future also on people to reflect on, on what do I do to the planet, and, but also, like you mentioned, technology, because, you know, if we talk about air travel, I do believe that there is a different way of transportation for every, let's say, um, distance that we have, and this is why I think, on one hand, air travel is not going away, but that we need to use technology to make it sustainable, and the good thing is the technologies for this are already there, but we have to industrialize them to make it possible. But when coming on the customer-centric side, which you agreed, I think the, the really important thing is um, and that it's now out there, you know, that it is important that we have to do things for the planet. There are frameworks, there are institutions. You know, what we were talking about before, business ethics, to make sure we really do it, and it's not just all, you know, <laughs> air pipe dream. Um, a dream, cool. clean washing, yeah, but the pipe dream, you know, and, uh, and um, but also I think the willingness of consumers, and I hope that that still goes up, and it's our job to also make clear to them what choices do they have, and uh, we have launched as the first airline in the world a possibility to already fly carbon neutral today, and we see that our cargo customers are using it, and also some corporate customers, that, but at this point in time, for individual customers, it's still a bit unaffordable, and it's up to us, together with policymakers, um, to make it affordable. What other initiative <laughs> do you have in the pipeline, and what is your, do you have a target? Yeah, we have a, a very clear target to uh, reduce our net uh, carbon footprint by, uh, by 2030 to 50, by 50 percent. So really, despite the growth, reduce, you know, which is the topic of this panel. But on the other hand, to be at zero emissions or net zero at, uh, at 2050, so really concrete uh, uh, topics. But we also know that we need a lot of investment, like it has happened in mobility or, or in green energy, uh, to get this done. And also a, a framework, a, a regulatory framework, like it has been done in other industries, to make it happen. And it needs consumers to also help along with that, to really be willing to take rain, green choices and, uh, and yeah, to do less, but, uh, and re you know, reduce each of our footprints. Banking. Yes. So how do you finance all that? <laughs> well, um, the good thing is that we have a role in all of that. Um, we need the clients. We are the facilitator between companies who need the money, um, between people with great ideas and the investor side. So we bring both parties together. And let me pick up Andrew, Andrew's um, example with the mobile devices. Um, if we recall, Steffi was sitting in this new vision of a mini. Yeah? All these components, and the normal car and the typical one comprises of thousands of different components, all these value chains, all these production facilities, all these materials need to be rethinked in terms of CO2 emission-free production facilities. And in all of that, that is a huge um, a chance for uh, the economy, for the companies, for the founders. And we are in the middle of that, bringing the people together, the companies together with the ideas to bring that forward. And that is uh, a very exciting um, time we are in. And that's why I um, share that uh, view also from, from Andrew, saying, well, yes, you can have growth, and you can have growth, but with less emission, right? And that is the topic we have. And in all of that, technology is very de enabler. And that's why this period is um, so important and exciting. You hear a lot about green bonds, and there are a lot of companies trying that, right? To finance and also to tap in this new market that is uh, ESG-led, environmental, social, and government issue-led, which links to the UN SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal. 
one of the leading investors would be the start of BlackRock that everybody receive a letter from. Um, but the risk profile change from institution to institution in terms of assessing um, this field. How are you creating or how are you working with your peers um, to have a common understanding and, if anything, a common taxonomy of the risk involved in these bonds? Well, the, 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 the framework is set by the European Commission. The framework is set also by the EZB. And in all of that, um, it is not the scarce resource these days is not the liquidity in the market. There is enough liquidity in the market. What is scarce are the right ideas to transform the economy into that. And leaving aside the pandemic where we are currently in, there is no single client meeting where financing of green ideas of sustainability plays not a major and important role. And on the other side, there is no single client meeting where people are not asking in which of the upcoming new technologies we can invest in. So the trend, the demand from the client, the market these days is huge. What we need to avoid, everyone, every stakeholder in that, is that what you called greenwashing. So if we finance a green venture project, then we need to make sure that we have a common understanding of how do we measure this impact. That is the big question going forward. And on that, I would assume, and we have quite some room um, to improve, to have this common standard, to make sure that the investors, the private investors, the companies can be assured that they can prove also us as, a, as an intermediary that they have done better with this investment. That is the big question going forward. And Andrew, I throw it at you again. There is a lot of talk about industry collaboration, even in the aerospace, but as well as uh, automotive. Any industry on their own, they're not going to make this, and they have to work together. But then there is this stakeholder approach as well, and government play a role. We have, we have heard in the other panel that government should intervene, but not too much. You said the same <laughs> even in the additional in innovation. What do you think the role of government in this space should be as it relates to the tech that enables um, sustainability? If, if any of us here have at least two economist friends, you know that economists agree on nothing, right? They just love to argue about fill in the blank. I have never seen a topic where there's more agreement across the profession of economics than about the question that you just asked. What's the right way to get all stakeholders involved, to get large scale innovation and coordination to bring us into a greener world? The overwhelming majority of economists would say, carbon price. Put a price on carbon. That is not a job that the market does very well. That is a job for governments. And the, the most potent weapon that we have to fight global warming is a, is a high enough price on carbon to spur innovation and to spur different behavior. My, my great frustration is that we're not doing it. And there's not one party that's to blame. The blame is very, very widely shared here. For example, there was just a referendum in Switzerland not too long ago where the Swiss voters, the people of Switzerland, decided to roll back their higher carbon price because they lost, uh, the, the, the people who are in favor of it lost the PR campaign, the public relations campaign, about the need for a carbon price in Switzerland. Well, and then you have country like India and China that are still... Mm. So, there, as I say, the blame here is very, very widely shared, but the frustration is a real frustration. There's one tool that will accomplish everything that we, that we just talked about, and we're not using that tool. Shame on us. Okay. <laughs> we launched the message. Those who are hearing us online, please take notes, and if you can do something, do something with this PR campaign. Christine, what do you hear from your customers as far as what they expect Lufthansa to do, or the industry, or even more, the regulators? Yeah, I think that especially also after the pandemic, we have to know that um, a lot of value was, was destroyed. You know, some value was also gained, but a lot of value was destroyed economically. And so obviously, I think that that will definitely hurt uh, what we can afford and be sustainable at the same time. And I think that's also a reality we have to face. 
Um, and, uh, and this is why, you know, I fully agree with you. We have to find regulation, but also it has to be global because in the end it's one planet. And if we have carbon leakage because, you know, some parts of the globe are much harsher than others, then in the end it's no gain for sustainability because you're just shifting the problem from one part of the globe to the other. And I, I turn back to you. Yep. So in, in this discussion, uh, when you think about the role that finance and the bank sector can play, um, where do you see uh, the role I mean, mainly playing on this carbon issue, for example, the carbon like price? Like my, 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 my colleague here is saying, I mean, the, the effort and the task is huge, and we are all in that together. It's not a single party, it is the politicians, the, the, the regulators, it is the companies, it is the banks, and you need a stable... And we all agree it's a priority by uh, now. And you need a stable in banking. Theory. The banking and, 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 and financial service sector to fund all of that and also to make sure that we guide all this liquidity into the right projects. And besides the stakeholders and the clients, it is also important to attract the right talent. So if I recall interviews I did a few years ago, and if I recall now interviews I do with our talent, um, the people coming from the universities these days, they don't care about whether we offer them a free car as a company, yeah. because they ride anyway with Uber or other um, forms of mobility. They care about what do you do as an institution for the overall society? What is your own carbon footprint? What is your moral standard on financing X, Y, Z? Are you engaged in weapons? Yes, no, do you hear there? That's what they are um, um, they're taking care about. And that, as a corporation, you have to tackle. Otherwise, you also lose the war on talent um, these days. And that's why, as I said, we are all in. You need a stable banking sector, and we need to have this framework Andrew was referring to. I'm, I'm going to ask the last question to everybody, because I'm mindful of time. Although we were running late, we're catching up. Um, do you think during COVID, and I think Christina has hinted to that, there has been a lot of, uh, yes, men and women, on, we need to be sustainable, but the board actually is still very much on the bottom line and the short-term gains and the stock price. Well, I have to say, and you know, no offense to the American system, but I'm quite happy uh, that we're in Europe because I do believe uh, in, in a balance uh, of that. And I'm happy to work at a company that does believe in a balance of, of social aspects and short-term gains because this is a strategic project. So this is not going to be over in five years, in 10 years. You know, this, this will take a, lo a lot of effort from all of us to, uh, to solve it. And, uh, and so I agree with you fully that you know, we have to take a long-term long perspective on that. Um, and I have, you know, and I don't know if this is a PC to say, but, uh, but a letter saying, you know, you have to be sustainable and you have to make exactly the same profit and we don't know what the, what the environment is, I think that is a joke. <laughs> Andrew, have you seen any of your students, especially executive students or board members, being blind? Although, from a PR point of view, paying lip service to this, or everybody has finally understood? People have finally understood. I completely agree. And there is still greenwashing going on. OK, fine. What's amazing to me is the sincerity of the effort from a lot of companies. And I think whether or not it's because they love the planet Earth, I think it's more what you said which is they cannot do business, they cannot attract talent, they cannot attract customers if all they're doing is greenwashing. I had a, a weird conversation a little while ago with the head of one of the largest private banks in the world who manages the wealth of some of the most affluent people in the world. And he said there's a generational shift happening in the families that we work with. And so a, a younger generation um, you know, even younger than us in most cases, are now in charge of the family offices. And he said, I cannot offer them a lucrative project that messes up the planet. And I said, come on. If you said, there's a mountain over there in Chile, we're going to take the top off it, and you're going to make 30% a year for 20 years, he said, they will not take that deal. I think that's fascinating, and I think it's really, really hopeful. Michael, do you have a concrete example you can share with us without sharing confidentiality information of investment that you have pitched, or the bank has pitched, um, that were particularly sustainable, and they got a lot of followers? 
Yeah, but let, let, let me jump on that. I mean, that yeah. is not the question in the board, is it either or. It is make the sustainability component happen and in parallel for sure have an eye um, on, on the, on the P&L. And it is not a contradiction, right? Mm. If this is true, what we have just discussed, then there are ample of opportunities out there. And be it all the renewable energy sector, for example, take all the electrification, take all the, the, the planning of these, of these new value chains or production facilities and or on the, on the mobility side up to the, uh, up to the airplanes. There are ample of projects. I serve on a board and we have a sustainability committee which I'm part of and we, See? we found a lot of efficiency working there. So, that's it. Anything about the product that... Or a founder. As, as said, it's on the renewable side, it's on the production facility, it's on the value chain side, they are ample. I cannot speak about concrete client um, <laughs> projects, I don't want to do that, but there are ample of projects in the pipeline. Last but not least, word from each of you. Andrew. Uh, I feel like I've, I've made too many friends here, so let me try to fix that with my last <laughs> remark. I said the most potent weapon that we're not using right now is the price on carbon. The second most potent weapon, I say, I say in Germany, that we are not using right now is nuclear power. And the reason we're not using it is that it messes with our intuition. And it messes with my intuition. I think nuclear power is really scary. Mm. I am wrong about that. The evidence is overwhelming that we have one power source which is scalable, potent, not intermittent, and very, very, very safe. And it's a critical component of our war on global warming, and we're not using it nearly enough around the world. Do, Steffi, do I ever get to come back to DLD or am I? He was <laughs> One of my heroes. Stuart. Five, five years ago, yep. he talked about nuclear power at DLD, about efficiency and on needed as well. So we've been very early with this, with your message already. And I, I, it scares me, nuclear power, it's, I'm grown up with yep. Atomkraft, nein, danke. But <laughs> maybe you... <laughs> Maybe, not maybe, I think you're right. For me, it's really about the power of ecosystems, and we've talked a lot about that. You know, different people that seemingly have different agendas coming together to solve problems, and I think it also speaks to the power of the human spirit, and that's why I share your optimism, you know, that I think we, we, we already know how to solve it, mm -hmm. now we just have to do it, and we have to bring the right people together to get it done. And to be fair, <laughs> um, one can see that half empty or half full, I don't want to be too over-optimistic, but we have reached already quite a lot, mm -hmm. right? Yes, you can look to all the negative things, right. but if you see what we have reached in the recent years, and it was not on top of everybody's agenda, now it is on top of everybody's agenda, which gives me hope. Yep. Yeah, is that easy? For sure not. Will we make it? Yes, I think so. I think out of this panel, I've learned two things. One, corporations are humans, and made of beautiful human beings that want to do more with less. <laughs> and the second one, that this is always an amazing event. Thank yeah. you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.